Hello and welcome to the Fix Your Fatigue podcast. Whether you can't get out of bed in the morning, your energy crashes throughout the day, or you're a biohacker looking to optimize your energy, productivity, and focus, this podcast is for you. I am Dr. Evan Hirsch, and I will be your host on your journey to resolving fatigue and optimizing your energy. And we'll be interviewing some of the top leaders in the world on fatigue resolution. Welcome. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Energy MD podcast, formerly known as the Fix Your Fatigue podcast, where we're on a mission to help a million people increase their energy naturally so they can be happier, have more fun and more success in every aspect of their lives. So today I'm really excited because we're going to be talking about one of the 33 causes that we deal with, which is diet food, nutrition with my friend, Dr. Sam Shea. And so let's learn about Sam. So Dr. Sam Shea helps busy health conscious entrepreneurs and mompreneurs attain and sustain health perform high performance so that they can create more freedom for themselves and others. He has dedicated his life to helping others through functional medicine and functional genetics. Dr. Shea walks, walked his own health journey from being chronically unwell from age 6 to 18, including severe fatigue, anxiety, digestive problems, chronic pain, severe insomnia, and poor nutrition. He dedicated his life to natural medicine to get himself and others well, which led him to functional medicine and functional testing. Dr. Shea is known as a lab nerd, creating customized programs for his clients based on testing. Dr. Shea has recently authored a new ebook on genetics where you can learn the different types of genetic based weight gain, how to future proof your brain, food triggers, how to genetically determine your optimal carb tolerance, vitamin D absorption, and immunity support. And one thing that's not in his bio is he's also a wonderful comedian. So check him out on YouTube. Dr. Thank Sam, you. thanks so much for hanging out with me today. Yeah, to be on brand, you the 33 causes of fatigue. Did I hear that correct? That's right. What, was 34 too many? <laughs> it's true. I figured I'd stop at 33. Like It's a very auspicious number. I was like, I don't know. It's a little suspicious to me. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. We're multiple gonna be of high. Sorry, it's not a multiple of high. I mean, I would expect to be 36 at least there, uh, Evan. You know, you can be I, on brand. You know I was thinking about it. I just couldn't get those three more. I'm sure they'll come up at some okay, point. I'll help you out, you know. Thank you. Thank you. One of the tribe will help you out. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about the five layers to determine your optimal diet and increase your energy. And I'm super excited about that because I have no clue what these five layers are. And uh, and so, yeah, so let's, let's talk about... Um, how to determine like one's diet, like in terms of like the benefits, like why is it important to um, optimize your diet or figure out what you're supposed to eat? Sure. So there's one, I come from a really long circuitous, baffling and confusing disarrayed experience of trying to figure out one diet to the next over the approximately 25 years of in and natural health. And I don't know if, this is true for other people are watching and watch watching. Wow. I just combined watching and listening. That's, that was unintentional. That's hilarious. <laughs> Anyone who is watching or listening, uh, this is the typical experience. I feel unwell. I've tried a bunch of things. Someone explained this diet to me and there's a person or a book or a personality or, or it was on a show or whatever. The diet makes sense. I tried it. I felt a change. It wasn't sustainable you know, for whatever reason. And now I'm paranoid about this particular group of foods. And then maybe it's not this diet, maybe it's this diet. And they try and they just, they just keep going on from one diet to the next, the next, 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 next. Mm -hmm. And, and what happens is that people get uh, diet fatigue. There you go. 34. No, <laughs> <laughs> they get diet fatigue. And <laughs> actually the 35th car, the 35th fatigue then is if too many people are on, uh, they, they watch too many summits on natural health, they get summit fatigue. Definitely. Yes. There you go. 35. Yeah. We'll get to We're 36. There. But there, yeah. We'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. So um, one of the things that people really get and benefit from knowing what their optimal diet is, is the end of confusion. And with the full understanding that the true diet, true optimal diet is customized. And it also explains why certain diets work for certain people and not for others. Because what happens is that people, some people do 
excellent at certain diets and they write whole books and build up entire businesses around it and, and media empires and all sorts of other things. And they help a lot of people. And then there is a meaningful percentage, some smaller, some larger, where those diets don't work for other people. Mm -hmm. And then it becomes this entire weird kind of medical gaslighting. Well, my diet works. You just need to do it harder. And this is, happens in the paleo community. This happens in the keto community. This certainly happens in the vegan community where it's it's almost like you're expelled from the the tribe if you dare even smell me you know and we've we've have a mutual colleagues who uh, came out who were vegan for 10 years and then they stopped because it wasn't working for them for that duration and they got lost one third of their list you know when they suddenly admitted to the sin of, of eating meat and diet is so wrapped up in people's personal politics they're their environment, their identity, their, their culture, their history, their family, their personal preferences, their health, their, all sorts of things. A diet becomes this, this monolith. And to just get clarity based on data will, one, bring clarity to oneself and also allow one to have compassion and understanding for how other diets are generally different for other people. That's one benefit. The other benefit can be just simple longevity that if you're eating incongruently you're going to have a shorter life period full stop the other thing is that it's going to stave off certain um it's really it's certain other health processes so for example if people are worried about dementia or neurodegeneration or things like that and i know what this, this focus is on fatigue but you know, my, it's just in front of mine because my father has dementia at the moment. And he, uh, you know, things like dementia and Alzheimer's, there's another word for it. It's called type three diabetes. Mm -hmm. Sounds diet related to me, you know, <laughs> really does. Really does. They give that name and that's the Western medicine community giving it that name. Definitely diet related. Then the other benefit is they save lots of money. People, you can, I estimate people can save at least $50,000 over the long term if they know their optimal diet. Uh, for example, the AARP identified the average cost of memory care in 2021, annual cost is $83,220. I just, I just went to their website, looked at what the average was across the states and multiplied it by 12 the monthly. You get $83,000 a year. There's your $50,000 savings right there if neurodegeneration is on your mind, and hopefully not in your mind. The, and that's just neurodegeneration, much less all the money you'd save on fad diets, Band-Aid supplements, uh, confusion, going to all, running all sorts of different rabbit trails around diet. And when I say Band-Aid supplements, sometimes people feel like they get deficient because they're on the wrong diet for them. They, they can become deficient because they're on the wrong diet for them and they should be ideally switching to a better diet. Mm -hmm. The other thing, the other reason, which I think everyone can appreciate is it's going to give back at least 50 minutes of low quality time per day. And, and when I say that, I'm being, I'm being technical. Here's why. According to distraction science or interruption science, yes, that is a thing. Interruption science is a field. A single interruption from a high focus task takes on average 23 minutes and 15 seconds to return back to the same level of focus. Wow. So if you are not eating a congruent diet and then you're foraging for food, whether it's foraging in your thoughts or you just happen to find yourself opening the fridge for the 37th time, you know, that is a distraction. So if I'm being generous and assume people forage for a minimum of twice a day, and they take about a minute to and a half to two minutes. Let's just call it two minutes. They do that twice a day. That's two minutes plus at least 23 minutes to recalibrate. That's 25 minutes each, at least 50 minutes a day. There's the mathematics of distraction because you were not in your optimal diet. So the, the benefits are huge. Longer life, the prevention of diet-based diseases, the saving of, of tons of money uh, over the long term. And on a day-to-day -day basis, you get a higher quality of life where you're not stuck in this foraging loop. Brilliant. Those are, those are all amazing benefits. And so then, so we're all on the same page. How do you define diet? I would, 
there, there's, there's macro and micro. So diet can be viewed on the micro level, what's in front of your plate. And then on a, on a slightly larger, it's what's in your fridge and cupboard. And then in a macro, it's like, what is the enduring relationship you have with the food that you consume that forms a regular pattern month to month, year to year that goes through some ebb and flows with the seasons of the year or the seasons of your life, holidays, travel, family, et cetera. But diet on the long arc is what are the familiar patterns that stream through your timeline of your life? And diets do change and shift. And I'll show you in the five-layer model exactly how they can change and shift and pivot appropriately given your circumstance. I mean, we're, I mean, like genetics is one aspect that doesn't change, but there's other layers that do. And this is where you have the adaptability that people need around their diet. It's, it's not, when I say everyone has a, everyone has an ideal diet, everyone has a, everyone has an ideal diet. Diet includes what's the rock solid genetic foundations and then all the fuzziness on top of it that you have to take into account for living in the world you live in. All right, well, let's do it. Let's jump into the fuzziness. What are those okay. five layers? So we <laughs> fuzzy. I hope it's gonna be warm and fuzzy when we jump in. <laughs> um, do you, uh, I have a visual I can share. Yeah. Okay. Let me give you, you permission to share. Okay, awesome. I get I get permission. I do feel warm and fuzzy. See, we made it. <laughs> and we'll just explain it for those of you who are listening and not watching. Yeah, yeah. To... I'll, I'll I'll definitely make make sure that uh, I, I talk visually. Nice. <laughs> so for the five layers are the following. It's a, it's a pyramid shape. The very bottom layer, the widest and biggest layer is the genetic layer. That is, that's the layer that is the foundation for your optimal performance and optimal health. Your diet, your genetics will tell you multiple things. For example, what is your, are, what's your carb tolerance? Are you genetically best suited for keto, Mediterranean, paleo, or high carb? Sorry, keto, Mediterranean, paleo, or high carb. And that's in the increasing order of carb consumption. And there's shades of gray. There's actually lower carb Mediterranean and higher carb Mediterranean. Lower carb Mediterranean is, is higher carbs than high carb paleo. And then there's low carb paleo, and then there's keto. So there's a wide spectrum of one's carb tolerance. And uh, when people, if, if people understand that, that has a massive effect on all your meals going out forward for the rest of your life. Additionally, genetics will tell you uh, what your inbuilt food triggers are. So for example, uh, what's your genetic relationship to gluten and say, celiac. If, some, if people have a genetic risk of celiac, then gluten is off the table, period, full stop. If, you know, you're like where we come from and we got lactose issues, you know, uh, it's very common. You know, I don't know, I don't know what, oh, pardon me, I don't know what uh, culinary Jewish masochist decided to tell us to eat bagels and cream cheese for years. But, but to me, like, to me, it's like the indigestion is coming from inside the house. Like, <laughs> <laughs> we've like we've got the, the the indigestion that comes from genetic vulnerability to gluten and dairy that those are two examples other examples are your genetic relationship to alcohol some people are fast metabolizers some people are very slow metabolizers of alcohol uh, some people are genetically reactive to salt and that's not just about blood pressure that actually can reveal if people have trouble losing the surface layer of weight and it's like this puffy watery weight that washes out their muscles no matter how much they exercise and they're not able to get rid of it they may actually have a genetic vulnerability to salt which increases water retention and so the weight that's on the top of their body isn't calories it's actually water the other genetic vulnerability this is the really interesting one that i discovered when i did the, the genetics here is caffeine induced anxiety and depression mm. caffeine induced anxiety and depression I was told that coffee was good for me, especially if I drowned it in modified coconut oil and lots of, you know, and other things. And I thought, oh, this, I'm, I'm healthy. And I would have like the most, you know, bulletproofy coffee ever. And I would still be, and, and it just, it fell off. And I, and I was confusing anxiety for energy. And I think there's a lot of people out there 
that have this issue where they, they have certain genetic SNPs that make caffeine uh, actually counterproductive, but they can think that they are having energy, but really what they're having is anxiety. And once I got my genetics back, I cut caffeine and I switched to non-caffeine uh, adaptogenic alternatives. And that has made a massive difference in my mood. Now, some for a lot of people, coffee is fine. They metabolize it and they don't have that risk. But for a lot of people, they really need to sit down. I'll ask your audience to reflect on, does caffeine give me anxiety or energy? Am I, and I, am I conflating the two? The other one is people's histamine intolerance. Now, histamine is uh, a, a complex subject, but to simplify it, the histamine is your, uh, it, it's part of your, to really simplify, it's part of an inflammatory response. So, so for example, if a bee stings your arm, the bee did not inject a half quart of liquid into your arm when it swells up. That's not what happens. It's, it's, the bee, it's a venom and the body's inflammatory response is, oh, look, something that's going to corrode tissues and will make us die. So what they, the, what the body does is it sends histamine to internally flood the area with water, swell up to do what? Dilute venom so that it won't corrode your tissues, which makes total sense. Mm -hmm. But we're dealing with this evolutionary balance. If I have, I want enough water to dilute the venom, but not too much that it chokes off arteries, joints, or, or nerves, or causes damage from the sheer pressure of and the distortion of the water. So there's this genetic variation. Like it's better to have a higher histamine response if you're likely to, if, if, if you're in a high venom situation. Uh, but it's not so good if it causes damage to your to your structure from choking off arteries, nerves, etc. So some people have a higher histamine response. Now, unless you're you know you're on um, an episode of Jackass, you're not going to be eating bees. So what? How is that related to diet? It's that there's there's food three types of histamine inducing foods. There's foods that have high histamine in them. There's foods that increase the release of histamine from like the mast cells inside the body. So you're, it internally generates the histamine from within, doesn't bring it from without necessarily. And then the third type of foods are the foods that block the enzyme that breaks down and removes histamine. So there are foods that have three separate mechanisms, other uh, three separate mechanisms to increase histamine in the body, which means that Instead of a, it's like a bee sting in your arm, when you eat any of these three types of foods, your, your digestive system and through your whole body, it's like a slow moving global bee sting. So you get this kind of inflammatory swelling response where you have this global inflammatory reaction through your system. And that's another reason why people who can struggle to lose weight despite exercising and eating, like there's a lot of really high quality, quote, healthy food that is healthy, but happens to be higher in histamine, that some people are very reactive to histamine. They don't may not realize like that's actually what's causing this water weight and inflammation in their system, even though it's like good food. So if you genetically identify, if you are histamine sensitive, then, then you can go through the hard yards of actually removing the histamine based foods if you are genetically vulnerable to it and then reap the benefits therein. Other things that come in with the learning the genetics layer is uh, understanding your relation to food allergens in general. There's about a dozen major genes that just collectively look at your response to food allergenicity. So for people who are have like larger swaths of these genes that have negative, the, the jargon is negative variants, but have like bad copies and air quotes of these genes, they would do very well in an elimination style diet modified by all these other things we're gonna talk about. Then there's other things on the genetics, like understanding your behavior relationships with foods, such as your relationship to bitter foods. If some people are super tasters for bitter, that means that they will, on the one hand, avoid coffee, alcohol, and uh, red wine, like, be like beer and red wine, but they will also avoid cruciferous vegetables because they tend to be bitter. Now, some people may avoid them from, you know, aviation-themed food trauma, here comes the plane, you know, the biggest Brussels sprout in the world when you're five years old. So you'll avoid those foods for that reason. 
my, but some people are genuinely averse to the taste of bitter and some people have no, don't really taste bitter. So they can have all the cruciferous vegetables all day. And if people are genetically averse to bitter, they will avoid, you know, 100, 200 pounds of cruciferous uh, vegetable matter a year, which adds up because they're just avoiding vegetables. And so the thing there is not to increase willpower. If you have a genetic vulnerability, it's that knowing your genetic vulnerabilities, you change your environment. You, it's, you prove your environment, not your willpower. So how do you change your environment? Well, there's four separate ways that I dug around when the chef ecosystem, chefing ecosystem to figure out how could you hide the, the taste of bitter just through simple cooking methods so that you can just change your culinary environment to take in foods you'd otherwise avoid. And then there's other genes like, are you genetically vulnerable to being a, a super liker of sugar or you avoid sugar? And then the other thing is, consumption of sugar some people genetically like there's some people who are like oh i love sugar but i just need one little thing of chocolate and i'm good i hate these people because some people genetic like me they're like i need like three bars like i just crave just one bar maybe one dozen bars of chocolate you know and that can be a genetic thing and again it goes to willpower not a versus environment i love like i do not keep things certain things in the house i'm smarter I, I, I am not, I'm smarter than bread. I'm not stronger than it. <laughs> so I just won't have it in the house. Like I I'm smart, but I'm not that I, it's just, I can't, my gen, I'm not going to fight my willpower. I'm just going to change my environment. So the genetics layer is super important. I, I feel that, uh, it, once people learn this foundation, then everything else makes more sense. The second layer is the therapeutic layer. Now, what do I mean by therapeutic? Clear. This is, is your current system in a state of imbalance that needs a temporary dietary or other therapeutic interventions in order to get to your genetics? I call this, your genetics are wrapped in metabolic barbed wire. I have two examples on either extreme. One, someone is genetically keto, meaning they have high, they do really well on high fat. However, they're, they have a ongo they have a current real problem with their gallbladder and or pancreas and or gut and or carnitine shuttle and or mitochondria where they can't digest, absorb, shuttle or use fats properly. That then if they eat high fat, they're going to feel way off because they can't use it, even though they're genetically predisposed to using it. And if they go low fat in order to bypass how awful they feel when they, because their gallbladder, gut, you know, gallbladder, pancreas, gut, the carnitine shuttle, they're not working, they're going to feel better on that, but they're not going to feel good because now it's going against their genetic predispositions. Hmm. Similarly, someone's genetically high carb, if they have a candida infection or any other type of infection that feeds off of carbs, if they eat high carb for their genetics, it's going to cause the infection to bloom, SIBO, whatever it may be. So now we have the metabolic barbed wire of an infection that's wrapping the high carb genetics. So then the thing to do is we have to go through the therapeutic layer and defang that barbed wire to then end up on the other side with, with their genetic foundations. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. And this, and this is, this is one of the most profound findings, uh, for people who've been struggling for years to figure out their diet because this is this is the exact archetype uh client i've tried every diet and every diet makes me feel awful i don't understand it's not fair some i know people who do keto they feel great new people who do mediterranean they do great people do high carb they do good. people do fodmaps this and low lectin that and they can just run through whatever was what a 30 100 books on diet are published a year i don't know so it's and, and they get so frustrated because there is no diet that works. And my discovery is that it doesn't work because there's you're always in competition. There's some conflicting nature mm -hmm. always at, at play. That's why it's not working. And what we have to do for that case is run both the genetics and also the functional testing. 
because the functional testing is in the therapeutic layer. Check gut testing, obviously, uh, would be one of them. Uh, looking at mitochondria, like the ion panel or Omex or whatever. Looking at uh, hormone systems, like adrenals have a huge impact on the immunity of the gut. And we can nerd out on secretory IG antibodies later if there's time at the end, you know. The, uh, the, this, the functional testing all is in the therapeutic layer, which is different from genetics testing. I separate them out. Genetics testing is a separate phenomenon from functional testing. They answer different questions. Both are critical, particularly if someone is struggling with their diet They don't, and they just feel trapped. They have both things are going on. They're in conflict. Then the third layer is preference. So preference is you can identify the, the, you know, we can go through the genetics layer and all the therapeutics and all the rest of it, but people have their personal preferences. Some people like certain foods and they don't. So they grew, this has to do with the culture they were raised in, their household. Uh, the, there is a genetic component of preference, like taste bud, you know, taste bud sensitivities, like we mentioned earlier. And people have to account for what is it I actually like to eat? And it may be a texture thing. It may be a flavor thing. It may be whatever it might be. And that has to be honored and taken into account because I can give someone the perfect diet, but it's nothing that they want to eat. You know, mm -hmm. that's impractical. So there, there has to be some allowance for, for flexibility. Um, by the way, by, by jogging back to the therapeutic, the, the therapeutic thing changes over time and over one's life based on your, your medical, like, for example, if some of, if, if, if there's a pregnancy, like diet changes, you know, if someone uh, had a bad accident and they need to have a specific diet that's radically extra anti-inflammatory versus, you know, uh, just a normal everyday fare. So the therapeutic layer adapts based on someone's current health status or just their, or, or what they're going through in their life. The, so with genetics, the first layer, therapeutic, the second layer, preference, the third layer, the fourth layer is access. This is one that's not talked about, and that's unfortunate. Access is, okay, do I live in within a 15-minute drive of a farmer's market that has all organic foods, and they know the names of the chickens and the cows and everything else and, and, and all that? Uh, or are you in this food desert? Do you have the time, the money, the logistics to source, acquire, prep, eat, clean, store, fresh, perfect food, every single meal for the rest of your life. What if you travel? What if you go out, you know, what if you go out to eat for a business or social event? Like that changes your access. Like it's, um, uh, uh, access is, is a, is something also that changes over time based on your location, based on your circumstances, based on your resources. And uh, I can't give someone who lives in a food desert, you know, uh, just here's, here's the out of the box diet plan with all the checklists, good luck. That doesn't take into account their on the ground reality. Right. Then the last layer is earth. And this is how your diet through your best understanding of your diet, I should say, affects the environment, your, your environment, your politics, and the economy. Now, when I say your understanding of it, because everyone has different opinions about politics, environment, and the economy, and I'm not going to go into details of that. I don't need to. I certainly don't want to. And But people can respect that reality. And some, you, you, see, this, you see this mostly in, in, the, you know, in the meat debate. It's you know, like what is... How uh, how is eating meat affect Earth? Now, for ex I have looked at numbers that it's about two uh, uh, factory farms. You know, according to one website, it's about two thousand gallons of water for every one pound of beef. That's that's one estimation. Okay, and then that there's the claim that it's only three hundred gallons of water per one pound of like rice, corn, and uh, wheat uh, for uh, any of those. And then I've then looked at the pasture fed and finished farmers who rebutted this claim and they showed their numbers like actually we it's only 150 gallons of water for a complete pasture fed and finished beef so fully half the usage of water f compared to rice corn and um wheat water now 
uh, then you come down to it's an access issue. Do you have access to pasture fed and finished beef? Mm -hmm. And for and the other thing we talk about agriculture, like almonds take about 2000 gallons of water for per pound. That's one reason, like I actually try to minimize my almond consumption when I learned about that, because that that's a lot of water for one pound of almonds. Now, I happen to be in an area that I have plenty of access to pasture fed and finished beef. I buy a quarter cow. You know, I happen to be extremely low carb. Um, in fact, I was eating, because um, that matches my, my genetics. I was eating the most perfect Portlandia diet ever. I knew the names of my farmers, their chickens, the quinoa was grown on a full moon and picked by left-handed monks and all that. <laughs> and I was still having digestive problems and energy swings and, you know, gas that was bad enough that could kill flies, melt paint and empty yoga rooms. And uh, oh, side bet, additional benefit of, uh, you know, you've sure you've been in that yoga class, right? <laughs> So side benefit of finding your optimal diet, you have more yoga friends. <laughs> <laughs> so when, when I switched my diet, when I did, ran my genetics on my uh, carb tolerance, I had the second lowest carb tolerance possible, similar to that of someone like an Inuit. Mm -hmm. And within one week of changing my diet to my genetic foundations, my gas and digestive problems of over 20 years went away. One week. And the reason why it was longer than a week, because I held out on the paleo bread, air quotes, the paleo bread, you know, the bread that's supposed to be, you know, paleo. Well, when you read the fine print and you look very, very carefully, there's a lot of, what was it? Arrowroot powder? I think it was arrowroot powder, which is technically a root. Super high carbs. Okay. But technically paleo, because it's a root, you know, and, uh, I was kidding myself. I literally was looking at the thing of paleo bread in full denial because it says paleo. That means I can have it. I, it says <laughs> it on the label. Uh, no, uh, that's another reason I keep bread out of the bread out of the house. So those are the those are the five layers. And some people would say the earth is the most important layer. And I say absolutely not. I say the first thing to do is figure out your genetics layer and then adapt your wider concerns to that. Figure out what works best for you health-wise. And then there's a lot of flexibility in how you engage with the environment, the economy, and politics that's harmonic with your, uh, with your belief systems. This is so brilliant. the five layers, just, just a quick summary, genetics, therapeutic, preference, access, earth. That's, that's the five layers. Yeah, I love it because you're, you're not only just taking into account the individual, but you're also mm -hmm. then taking into account their particular situation at the time, their culture uh, in terms of like preferences, you know, like what you grew up with, and then these other social political issues on access and earth. So it's very um, multifaceted, very layered, as in, and maybe you would call it, maybe a five-layered um, approach which well, it actually does say it right there oh my layers. gosh how about that yeah, yeah i love it it's great you know, and, and right right there in black and white writing right there. <laughs> yes. yes go on it does. Yeah, that was my attempt at great, great, great job there, comedian Dr. here, but you know, but yeah. So let's talk a little bit about you the write genetics. A book, didn't you? I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> like words, like no words. <laughs> exactly. So let's talk about genetics. You know, most of the time when we talk about health issues, we say they're you know twenty percent genetic and eighty percent environmental. But in this case, genetics is kind of like the biggest part of this pyramid. Can you talk a little bit about maybe that push and pull between environment and genetics? Yeah, so if, uh, I mean, we can just go back to my you know, yoga analogy there, <laughs> yoga room analogy. If I am eating incongruently from my genetics, there's going to be consequences of which other people suffer most of in this particular case, in, in a small room with no ventilation. So the what, what happens with genetics is that uh, uh, you, people have this, this playing field. It's their genetic playing field. And some people have a bigger genetic playing field than others, or it's a different, it's a different shape, or there's certain parts of it that are more in bounds and some more that are out of bounds. And w if you know your genetics, then you know what, where your playing field is and, and where you can play within. 
Uh, another analogy is um, there was a, when I was in college, there was a professor there that was a classically trained uh, Indian flautist. And so he, that, I mean, the, I mean, he played, I couldn't believe what I was seeing when I saw him play the flute. It was unbelievable. And he, in that tradition, they have something called ragas. And, and ragas are, I, I'm going to be super clumsy in my definitions here, but it's basically like, uh, uh, it's not a melody. It's, it's, it's like, there's a specific pattern. There you go. It's the pattern of how you play. And he says, there's, he said, there's thousands of ragas, but one can only master maybe a dozen or so in one's lifetime, Ma like truly master them. He said, a raga is a cage and you must learn how to fly within the cage. That's what genetics is. You must learn how to fly within your cage. Mm. So when you learn your genetics, then the rest is how to fly. And if you don't, and if you are operating outside your genetic boundaries, then your wings get clipped and you fall to the floor and there's poop there. And you, the net, we can go as far into the analogy as we want. Uh, so uh, I had a bird and I'm thinking of the bird cage now. So I got to get that image on my head. Anyway, <laughs> my uh, uh, environment, environment, everything you do is interpreted through your genetics. What you eat, how you think, how you move is interpreted through your genetics and what you express uh, if, if you have people with the exact same lifestyle identical lifestyle they're going down the same highway but the genes you know what diseases or, or issues manifest there's different exits so some people they careen into this exit other but they don't careen into the other exit that's what the other person does so they can have the exact same lifestyle but what entries and exits are different based on your genetics? I, I think I think we're swimming in enough metaphors here. So to add in another metaphor of swimming all the way onto birds and driving and playing fields. So <laughs> well done. Well done. I'm not sure you could get another one in there. We could try. I can always inspire. Yes. So then, you know, people are probably familiar with the adage that, you know, genetics loads the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. Trigger, right. And, and whether that environment is uh, food. That is a, wait, that is another metaphor. Wait a minute. It is another metaphor. Oops. Whether it's foods or whether it's heavy metals, chemicals, molds, infections, allergies, negative emotional patterns, like all that sort of stuff. You're listing 33 things? Is this the thing you're doing? You listing um, I, that's, that's some of them. That's some of them, okay, right? Okay, just checking. But those are those things that pull the trigger, right? Would you agree with genetics loading the gun, environment pulling the trigger, or is that old thinking? Um, the, the thing that's missing is the feedback loop. That's the, the, the problem. The problem with that metaphor is that it's also a self-loading gun in certain, in certain respects. Like, like the, the metaphor is useful for a meaningful percentage of one's entire lived experience, but, but there's also a feedback loop that goes on as well that your genetic, so it was someone's, if the environment is the, the environment, you're, you're living, you're hyper reactive to histamine or whatever. Uh, and there's, um, how would I, no, no, let me, there's a, there's a better, there's a better analogy. So somewhat like I've overcome, uh, uh, I've overcome two addictions, sugar and video games are quite public about it. I have lots of writings on it. I'm not going to go into the details of that. I will use that as an example of someone can have a, someone can have a, a predisposition genetically to get very looped into their dopamine react reactivities and start the, the, the molecule of more of, of craving, you know, just spinning and you get this environmental input and you have the genetic predisposition which then drives to engage with more of the environmental input which then further stimulates the genetic vulnerability and it just creates this feedback loop and that's what i'm talking about is that the, the, in some genetic cases it's a self-loading gun and that's that's where the metaphor needs needs some more nuance okay and it's self-loading or it's it's self-loading in the sense that there's ways that we are triggering our own genetics. The uh, genetics the, then drives the environmental behavior, which then feeds the genetics to then drive the further environmental behavior. That's what I mean by self-loading. Okay. 
And in the, in the history or in the evolution of genetics and genetic testing, I'm really glad that you mentioned at one point that there were like 12 different genes that you're looking at that kind of or, uh, understand, that are able to talk about something. I can't remember what it was exactly, but- Food allergens, the, 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 about, about a dozen or so food allergenicity genes, yeah. Okay, and so then in terms of genetics now and their ability for like these lab tests to give us accurate answers, where are we at in that? I mean, do we know everything there is to know about genetics? And if there are multiple genes that that are need to inform us about different things, do we know all of those different genes that can inform us? Or is it enough? Yeah, I'm just curious where we're at. Okay, so there's there's a there's there's a many layers to answer that question on on one hand knowledge is doubling roughly every two years in a given field maybe it's faster these days so that's number one uh so whatever we know now uh there'll be it'll be whatever we know now is a lot less than what it's going to be in the next two years and that's one reason why we call you know it a practice is because we go based on the knowledge we have the best knowledge we have that we're exposed to today and where as long as we keep learning and keep growing, we keep layering uh, all of our information, we just keep moving forward. Uh, and that's, that is what, that's one reason why, you know, you and I are on such podcasts, make such podcasts, listen to other podcasts to, and, and also go to conferences and talk to colleagues and, and you know, interview other experts, et cetera, is because it, we need to stay ahead of the game to make sure that we are on, know the most up-to-date material. In the field of genetics, there's a couple things that are going on. Uh, one, you have the attitude of we need every gene, and we're just we'll, the AI will figure it out, and we'll just you know spit out the 500 genes related to health, and here's your 500 health tips, really one you know a health tip per gene, and it's not organized or prioritized. Here you go, good luck, and that's most of the experience that people have when they go to you know go through genetic platforms like 23andMe or Ancestry is they are served up this giant colorful report that basically functions as serves to confuse, overwhelm, and ultimately scare and intimidate the people who engage with it because there's too many genes. It, it's not prioritized. It's not organized. And everything seems equally important. And, and every gene has one or more specific thing to do. And we, can, we can't spend the first 12 hours of our day preparing for the day because our genes are so we it becomes alarmist mm -hmm. and that's not helpful or practical uh a different approach is that uh we don't chase individual genes some individual genes like like super rare genetic disorders etc those are important to really nail down the specific gene other genes are looked best as clusters like we can look at there's there's hundreds of genes involved with inflammation but what are the top 15 genes of inflammation that control the hundreds and hundreds underneath them let's look at those and then let's not look at individual ones within the 15 let's look at the pattern of inflammation as such so one of the panels that i do looks at the 15 most important inflammatory genes now for me i have 13 out of those 15 have negative variants so am I chasing after interleukin-6 or TNF-alpha or uh, interleukin-10-1 or, or, or the CRP-whatever? No, I'm looking, oh, there's a pattern here with a problem with inflammation as such. Therefore, I will not try to find 13 individual lifestyle changes to deal with those 13 separate genes. Instead, I will find, based on the peer reviews of research done on humans, not wombats or nematodes, what lifestyle change, diet, exercise, nutrients, et cetera, will beneficially shift the expression of all or most of those genes? So what is the fewest number of lifestyle interventions that will beneficially shift the behavior of those 15 genes, or the rogue ones, in my case, 13? So well, just to be clarified, when people say, I'm going to change my genes. No, you're not going to change your genes unless you're dumb enough to inject CRISPR into your bicep. Just go ask that Russian dude on the internet. <laughs> that's a that that's a thing. Um, uh, his bicep is like the size of his torso. It's really freaky. Anyway, uh, so you're not. 
so in, in, in genetics, we have the yellow, we have the so-called traffic light system, the green, yellow, red dot. So green is a quote, good gene. The yellow is a quote, bad gene. Red is a quote, really bad gene. It's, it's, it's very clunky, but that, that's what the way it is. And if someone has a red and yellow gene, that's what I'm talking about. The 13 out of 15 of those are of my inflammatory genes are red or yellow. My lifestyle behavior, my lifestyle changes. They don't ever make the yellow and red dots green. They make them behave green-like, mm -hmm. green-ish. So that's what it's meant by epigenetics. Epigenetics is the green and yellow, sorry, the red and yellow dots are going to behave more like a green gene. As long as you stay consistent with the right, with a high enough input, consistently, the genes, the rogue genes will behave better. Now, there's a dosage issue as well that most people don't know about. You know, like the fish oil, for example, is incredible at shifting most of the pro of most of the pro-inflammatory genes to behave more uh, to behave more like a green dot. But its dose matters. So there's a nutritional dose. If I have my one gram of fish oil, I had took one gram of fish oil for years, years and years. But there's another term called nutrigenomic dosing. Not nutritional, nutrigenomic, which means that the high, a higher dose actually changes the gene expression. Uh, I'll make this even uh, simplify. You throw, you throw a gram of fish oil into the system, it's just throwing widgets into the existing machinery, which is fine. But if you give two grams, three grams, four grams for people that actually need it, you don't just throw widgets into the machinery, you change the machinery. That's the difference. It's, it's, it, there's a dosage issue that you can discover in genetics. Someone, if you genetically need way higher amounts of specific nutrients because your genes are so, um, uh, so much compromised in the environment we have today. I, I, uh, so my approach to genetics is to, it's an 80-20 principle. What are the most important genetic genes to look at? Of those genes to look at, what is the pattern within those genes? Are you an inflammatory weight gainer? Are you a toxic hormonal weight gainer based on like liver detox genes and some other like CRP genes and liver, et cetera? Are you a calorie fat weight gainer? By the way, this is the least common. Most people's weight is from inflammatory water weight. Just spoiler. Uh, when I've looked at all these, you know, all these gene tests, um, my, I look at what's the pattern and then I find the fewest number of lifestyle interventions that beneficially shift the behavior of the most number of the most important genes. Hmm. That's how you do genetics. One other nuance, the carb tolerance test is not a variant analysis. It's a copy number analysis. It's the number of duplicates of the amylase producing gene, not the variant. It's like the number of cannons lining the fort. So I, I'm a two in this model. I have two copies of this gene. It means you have two cannons spitting out amylase to break down carbohydrates. Someone has eight, that's four times the capacity because they're all firing at the same rate. Mm -hmm. So that's how I can determine someone who's keto, paleo, Mediterranean, or high carb based on a scoring system because and it's not a variant analysis it's it's additive it's 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 the number it's the number of duplicates and that's that is a three dimensionality to genetics that almost no one knows about or understands there's a certain genes it's not the variant that's important it's the number of duplicates that's important because the actual variance within that gene is trivial like it does like some variants is like, it, does a, it gives you a hundred X output. And then like the yellow gives you like 75 and the red gives you 30 other variants. It's like, it doesn't mean 197 and like 93, like there's so little variation. It doesn't matter. That's why the duplicates matter way more. And this is, this is that case. So, so the, what's happening in genetics in terms of the, the, the field is that you have many different companies. What they're doing is people are, as the technology to detect genes gets better and better, what's happening is there's more and more clustering of genes together as certain packages and like profiles. Hmm. That's that we're leaning, we're leading away from single gene analysis. This one gene causes this. Now it's moving more towards clustering. 
And then there's other aspects of genetics that are coming out that require different machines and different infrastructure and different analysis to look at the three-dimensionality of genetics, which is the number of duplicates. And there may be other things. There may be other interactions we don't know in the future. So, so, so then for the lay person on that, so when you're saying variance, you're basically meaning a change. So if the gene is, is changed from its normal or ideal no, situation, or it's not, re it's not green, it's yellow yeah, yeah. or red. That, that the variant means is it a, is, it's a yellow or a red. Gotcha. Yeah. And then the duplicate. So you're saying that it doesn't matter if it's a yellow or a red in some situations. It's more about, like you said, these cannons that are spitting out amylase in this particular case, with it, which is a digestive enzyme that allows you to right. digest carbs. So if Carb. you don't have enough of those cannons, then you're not digesting carbs as well. And so it has nothing to do or less to do with those actual changes that you're seeing in the genes. It has less to do with the variation of the gene. It's more with the, the duplicates of the gene. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. Yeah. So then, yeah, lots of really interesting um, directions that I want to go, but I want to be respectful of your time. Um, a couple of other questions. So then, ideally, the best test would be... Would it be an, a genetic test or an epigenetic test? I would, I would say that it's an epigenetic test because if you can actually look at an inflammatory marker and you can see that that's off, it doesn't matter what your genes say. But what's your opinion? Okay, so the answer is, is, is both and neither. Uh, <laughs> so my, here's, so let's, let's use that inflammatory marker example. So some people uh, need way more of a thing to drop that inflammation marker based on their genetics. So you can have out of the box protocols to, you know, wh however much curcumin you want to shove up someone's nose, you know, it's some people may need both nostrils, like not just one. It's, it's some people genetically need way, like that fish oil thing I described to you. I need way higher levels of fish oil than the normal human because of the inflam inflammatory issues I got going on. But if you have and, if you have really good inflammatory testing, then you're going to know because you're going to take one gram and it's not going to shift your inflammatory markers, and so you're just going to keep increasing it until the inflammatory markers come down. Yeah, but the thing is, is with that, it's a practical issue. It's like how often am I going to run those inflammatory protocols? Sure. You know, I don't I don't have the luxury of every month getting my inflammatory protocols checked. So so if I if I know if I know the genetics, then I I can understand proper dosing. Uh, for longer term protocols. The, the other thing is that we're, we're going to pull it back to that metabolic barbed wire wrapping around your genetics. It's, a, it's an ordering. If someone's dealing with a lot of stuff, and if I had to pick and choose between therapeutics and genetics, I'm mean, sorry, a function, epigenetic testing, which is functional testing, that's, you know, like that testing and mitochondria and all the rest of it, I would do the functional stuff first then to defang the metabolic barbed wire, then I would follow up later with mm -hmm. the genetics so I know what their baseline is going forward so that they, it went, so they know what to do for the rest of their life after the therapeutic period window was closed or window after the therapeutic issue is, is resolved. That, that's really, mm -hmm. it's an ordering issue if someone's in therapeutic need. Yeah, that's, that's, that's really helpful. So then when you see somebody and they're ill, initially, their, it sounds like their genetics for their diet is probably not going to match with what they need to be consuming because of what you've spoken about. Metabolic barbed wire. Yeah. yeah. But once you get the genetics, you've got the genetics, and then you can keep coming back to them and saying, okay, this is why this is happening. And then, so all you need to do is get your genetics once. Yeah. You just know where you're going for. You know where you're aiming. I mean, that, that's one of the other beauties of doing genetics is that if if someone does all of their genetics and they get it interpreted properly and they have the roadmap for life, and even if they implement all the genetic recommendations and things aren't working, and it's like, oh, guess what? There's a therapeutic layer. There's metabolic barbed wire to deal with first. Go deal with that. Then you come back to the genetics. It's not the test wasn't a waste because, mm -hmm. in fact, it was, it was helpful to clarify, you know what? I got some other stuff I got to layer through first. And then you just come back to it. You just know where you're going. You may just have to take a detour or two. That's all. Right. Wonderful. Well, I could I could talk to you seriously for another hour. 
Um, but but, but we're no gonna, more. God, we're, that'd be way too much even for me. I'd exhaust me. God. <laughs> <laughs> but so where can people go to learn more about you? Oh, and actually, before we do that, you've got a free gift here. Why don't you stop sharing your screen so I can see a little bit oh, better? Oh, sorry. Yeah. No worries. Um, so you've got a free gift for folks. We're going to put the link down below. Can you tell us a little bit about this? This free gift. Sure. It's going into much more detail of those five layers. I mean, I've got several, I've got several free eBooks. Uh, this is an e-guide on, on specifically the genetics of diet. I've got a couple other things that expand more into other genetics, but for the purposes of this conversation, the, the e-guide on the on optimal diet is the most appropriate uh, for people to get access to. They can go to my website, drsamshay.com, D-R-S-A-M-S-H-A-Y.com. And it's all listed there. I'm also on YouTube. Uh, you can put Dr. Sam Shea into YouTube. There you'll find a whole bunch of my other interviews as well as my stand-up comedy because Woo. I can't not but help but you know share that the gift of humor. It's I, I think it's funny for whatever that's worth. So there you go. I thought it was <laughs> at least funny. someone laughing. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. And then the, you work with people one-on-one -on -one, in groups, courses. What are you doing now? So uh, I have I have some courses, uh, and uh, mostly I work with people one-on-one -on -one at this point. There will be a point where I'll have to transition to more groups uh, as as things expand. But right now, I do work with people individually, and they can go to my website. And if, as of this recording, I'm still doing. Uh, you know, chats, uh, you know, they can sign up for a 15 minute, you know, chat with me to see if uh, what I have to offer matches what their needs are. Excellent. And you can see people all over the world, Early. right? Just yeah. virtual. Yeah. Wonderful. I was, I was virtual before I was fashionable. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Dr. Sam, thanks so much for hanging out with me today. I really appreciate all your knowledge and all the value you provided. Well, thank you. It was really great to chat with you. I had a lot of fun. I look forward to chatting again in the future. I hope you learned something on today's podcast. If you did, please share it with your friends and family and leave us a five-star review on iTunes. It's really helpful for getting this information out to more fatigued people who desperately need it. Sharing all the experts I know and love and the powerful tips I have on fatigue is one of my absolute favorite things to do. If you'd like more information, please sign up for my newsletter where I share all important facts and information about fatigue, from the foods and supplements to the programs and products that I use personally and recommend to others so that they can live their best lives. Just go to fixyourfatigue.com forward slash newsletter to sign up and I will send you this great information. Thanks for being part of my community. Just a reminder, this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional care by a doctor or other qualified medical professional. It is provided with the understanding that it does not constitute medical or other professional advice or services. If you're looking for help with your fatigue, you can visit my website and work with us at fixyourfatigue.com. And remember, it's important that you have someone in your corner who is a credentialed healthcare professional to help you make changes. This is very important, especially when it comes to your health. Thanks for listening. 